And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. He is the co-creator of Don't Ever Blink. I'm pretty sure that's nightmare. F I'm pretty sure just that phrase alone is triggering for Doctor Who fans. The cre <laughs> the creator of the upcoming War of War Priest, which is get which is going through a enhanced edition currently on Kickstarter. The one and only Richard. Don't call him Sean Kemp. How you doing, <laughs> today, man? I am doing great. How about you? I'm do I'm doing pretty good. I'm still I'm. I'm in the middle of my seasonal adjustment because it was dre it was dreary and rainy for the for most of the week, and now it's br now it's unfortunately bright and sunny. <laughs> unfortunately, Unfor unfortunately for a guy like me, yeah. <laughs> but, Dang. So it, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. Um, in lieu of that, where? What was your gateway drug when it came to when it came to uh, comics? Um, <clears throat> so that's always a, a a fun question for me because it it actually goes all the way back to the late seventies because my older brother is about eight years older than me and he was into comics, so when you know for for as literally as long as I can remember. There were comics everywhere, all around. And the best, you know, whatever toys existed at that time were, you know, not many. But I was just always around comics. And I still have many of his original collection in my collection from the 70s. So, I mean, it's pretty simple. It was just always there, and it always appealed to me. Mm -hmm. And... When it whenever whenever it comes to people's introduction to comics, especially introduction to comics in the states, um, I always I always have to ask the big question because this was one of those dividing line things growing up. <laughs> Were you a Marvel guy or a DC guy? Uh, Marvel all the way. Yep, DC. DC. I mean, I like DC. Everybody loves Batman, you know, but. But Marvel was always number one for me, which I think I think is I think is completely understandable, especially since you mentioned get getting your start in the um, in the set in the seventies. So that would be right. That'd be around that'd be around the time when a lot of um, a lot of Marvel properties were really starting to hit the, were really starting to hit their stride, and that was especially during the era of um, Jim Shooter. Yeah, yeah, Ooh, um. yeah. I I think I think too. Marvel really jumped on the kung fu, you know, craze, and you know, I I think they were smart to do that, you know, and it still pays dividends today. So yeah. the I'd say, I'd I'd also I'd also say that um. That you ha that you ha with a lot of with a lot of these with a lot of the stuff that was a lot of the stuff that's con that's considered required reading these days got got its start during during that um seventies eighties era and it's in an, and it also came right around the time when the comics code authority was really starting to lose their um their I guess I I guess I can say pull yeah um. After that, after that one, I forget the I forget which number it was, but I but I remember that there was one um, issue of Amazing Spider-Man that they re that Marvel really wanted to tell the CCA would not give their approval, and they published the thing anyways, and the CCA got raked over the coals for the fact that they tried to um, get they tried to not give permission for for this well-regarded story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, there were there were a couple of things like that, I believe. 
uh, around that time. So I think we saw I think we saw comics beginning to mature and try to tell stories that that meant something. I'd say I'd say what I'd say it was I'd say it was more of tr- more of trying to heal because there are already a f- there are already a fair share of mature comics even during even during the golden age but what it but what ended up happening is a little bird named Frank Wortham came along and fucked it all up <laughs> <laughs> um eh, with because I had to I had to read through Seduction of the in, of the Innocent when I, when I was in high school and oh wow I um my report my report on it was about eight pages long my at my um my additional remarks was about was about ten pages long just going into <laughs> detail how much I hated that book <laughs> um, oh that's funny and what mostly. Granted, it was it was somewhat spiteful on my part, but it was just there. There was just so there was just so much nothing in the thing, and so and so much dead air, and I just I just couldn't stand it. So I wanted <laughs> to make every I wanted to make anybody who read my report know I hated doing this. <laughs> but uh, sounds like you succeeded. <laughs> um. Well, I. I I had already get I had already gained a reputation as the as the guy who would be willing to submit a twenty page report in mirror writing because the teacher was dumb enough to have the due date on April Fool's Day, so nobody questioned it. <laughs> pro, t- pro tip professors everywhere, don't don't ha- don't have April first as your due date. You're just asking for trouble. <laughs> um, nice. But but that brings me to um to war priest how how did the, how did this how did this particular adventure really get started what was the um, what was the spark i i that's a good question I, I i don't know the spark was i don't know what made me put it together in in that way um you know if if, if for people that read it, I, I suspect that they'll see the various influences um, that I've had over the years. Everything from, you know, m- anything that I think I know about magic and things like that is all Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> um, anything that, uh, you know, involves sword fights is going to be some mix of D and D with with samurai lore with you know anything like that. Um, I love or grew up loving you know kung fu and and I think I think you'll see all of those influences in this in this story in this book. Um, but what put it together? I don't know. I don't know. I think I came up with the way he looked, and then sort of built around that. I would imagine. I would imagine it started with the hat. Yeah, and I and um, that's where I can that's where I can see the the um, kung fu com- comparisons. That yeah, get brought up. Um, whether whether it be whether it be through the through the hat as the hat as 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 I've under as I've understood it, but also, um. The more the more gamer and end, end, end of the crowd will probably recognize that 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 hat from Mortal from Mortal Kombat and yeah yeah the, and let's not, let's not forget that the film that the film that's kind of the patient zero for what would be considered a fighting game story is Master of the Flying Guillotine <laughs> right on yep yep granted that's not that's I... not the case with Mortal Kombat the inspiration for that was Bloodsport but when it comes to the whole a bunch, a bunch of fighters being drawn together in a tournament to bait one person out. That's. <laughs> I'm not. Gonna yeah. s- I can't say that it's that flying guillotine is the is where is where everybody was drawing it from, but it is it is um the template. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's one of those things. Even if they don't know it's the template, you know, they got it from somewhere else. But where somewhere else got it from <laughs> was there. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, yeah, 
it's interesting that you meant it's interesting that you bring that you bring up these these kind of di these kind of um disparate parts um and in in that regard since since a lot of it started from des from designing the designing the uh, character um what prompted you to go with the dis the um dystopian setting that you had, that you ended up going with um also a good question. I I have this theory that it's not really a dystopian future. I, I think I think the time that came after the height of the Roman Empire was a dystopian future. Does that make sense? So this is just the next the world that War Priest lives in is just the next sort of thing after after sort of great empires have fallen. You know, my thought is, is, you know, if America was to collapse for whatever reason, um, it would take a lot with it. And it wouldn't necessarily have to be a, you know, a true dystopian type world. It would just be the world that was left behind after you know we lost the internet and you know there was no more international trade and you know just the years that follow you know to me it would be a a, a world that sort of started over yet again and it's interesting that you br it's interesting that you bring that kind of thing up because um unfor unfortunately because of how it's been used in pop culture for the last 30 years a phrase, a, a term like dystopia has developed a degree of baggage. Yeah. Like if I were to if I were to play word association with what someone would consider dystopian fiction, um, they would prob they would probably end up thinking of things like um Mad Max or nineteen eighty four. Sure. And while that's while that certainly while that certainly can apply, um. The thing, the thing is, with with all of those, you either ha you either have complete and total lawlessness or complete and total authorit authoritarianism, and right none of and none of those I would say are a requirement for a dystopia. That's why it's in, that's why it's interesting that you bring up um po the um the post Roman Empire because just because. Now, grant now granted, my my history on the Dark Ages is is up uh, is a bit rusty since I haven't I haven't read up on that era in in a while. But if I recall correctly, a lot of the states that were init that were part that were part of Rome after the, after it fell just became just ended up becoming a series of fiefdoms. Yeah, yeah. Um, once you once they lost that that centralized you know not even government but just influence mm -hmm. you know people people just you still had to get through the day you still had to survive mm -hmm. and so it just sort of naturally occurred I, I don't think you know i don't think a dystopian future is necessarily uh i mean i don't know you know who knows but but like you said it's been done to death so many times it's either you know the future is is either crazy you know technology or it's just the worst of the worst um and this story sort of takes place you know like a thousand years from now you know so whatever we've we just sort of started over i mean we didn't have running water again for for a thousand years after after the roman empire fell so it you know it it's easy for me to call it, you know, in its in, on Kickstarter, it says dystopian future and stuff, but I've never viewed it as that. I've always viewed it as just the natural order of what happens when, when, you know, the big shit on the block crumbles. And the other, the other bit of comparison I, f I find myself making, oddly enough, is conan and that, that's not the last time I'm absolutely gonna that's not the last time i'm going to be referencing robert e howard because conan's hybor conan's um hyboria yeah is ostensibly ostensibly a post-atlantis ancient world 
Right. Um, with a lot of the with a lot of the um, nations being pr- being prototypical um, representations of nations that would that would appear that would appear in the medieval age and onward. The Sumerians out are outright described as pro- as proto Celts. Granted, some of that was was a bit was a bit of a bias on um, Howard's part as as an Irishman in, <laughs> in Texas <laughs> right, in the right. 1920s. <laughs> right. Um. But the but there's the fact that at Atlantis, as ad, as advanced of a society as it is, acor- according to Plato's Republic, which, for all intents and purposes, Plato's Republic is not it is the equivalent of a po- is the equivalent of a popcorn flick. <laughs> right. 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 Like a a lot of people a lot of people seem to forget that when ta- when when discussing the prospect of. Um, Atlantis, but you you have that same you have that same kind of vibe. This this massive superpower that that was um, that was completely that was completely dissolved, and everybody else is left to pick up the pieces. And right. when tr- when trying to do that, obviously ob- you're going to have more civilized spots, and you're going to have places that are le- that are less civilized or diff or different types of it. Um, Howard was Howard was not a was not exactly a fan of civilization as a virtue, as indicated by what happened when hit when the um, place in Texas that he grew up in um, struck oil. Right. Um. Of course, the other the other um the other Howard character that I was strongly reminded of. Um. When I look when I looked at War Priest, and I'm curious if this was an inspiration for you, is Solomon Kane. Um, I mean, no, not really. You know, it, it, it crossed my mind. Um, and I was, I did read a bunch of those stories right around the time. Maybe it was more of an influence than I realized. I did read a bunch of those stories, Mm -hmm. um, right around the time that I came up with this. I, I bet it was an influence. It's just not one that I sort of grew up with. Yeah, I'm relatively new to that character. And when it comes, given given what you mentioned regarding comics, when it comes to Conan, would it be would it be fair of me to assume that your that your big introduction to Conan was the um, was the '80s Marvel comics? Uh, so actually, and and I can't I can't remember. It was actually I don't know if if you've seen or you remember the 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 lar- the giant issues and in black and white. With the with the uh, Franzetta painted covers, I'm f- I am familiar. Um, I am familiar with them. Right. So my brother actually had a bunch of those, and so that's really where my original love of Conan came from. Was were those oversized black and white uh, adventures, which. Does cer- does certainly make sense, especially since a lot of um, a lot of people, a lot of Mar- a lot of Marvel folk had had uh, gotten their had gotten their start doing more um, str- doing more strip style stories. You know the kind that you the kind that you would see in the paper. Right, right. Um, even a- even after he st- even after he stopped working with Marvel, st- um, when it came to the comics proper, Stan Lee for the longest time had a had still done a. Spider-Man strip in its in its old fashion, and right. Of course, when it comes to dramatic strips, the king of that that's still going to this day is Prince Valiant. <laughs> right, right. Um, but with but when it come when it came to when it came to the when it came to the uh, setup that you ha- that you ha- that you have where um. Essentially, the U.S. is divided into twelve, into, as we know it, is divided into twelve um, wards. Each yeah, each with the a... southeastern U.S. Mm-hmm. Right, the southeastern and part of the U.S. When you were developing this, did you end did you end up making a a rough map of what of what the wards um, looked like? Uh, no, but that is that is happening. <laughs> I just didn't at that time. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, even, you know, sort of obviously the, the Conan, uh, Chimeria, those, those maps, you know, were the influence of, of that idea, you know, but I also wanted to show without, without saying this is what used to be the United States, you know, I just made it obvious with the map because, you know, again, this is so far in the future that doesn't mean anything to anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it being the United States one time doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot. You know, it does a little more so to the main character, Matthias, because he's actually, uh, and this will come up a little bit more later. He's the, the librarian, if you will. So there will be a time where we see sort of these ancient texts and, and tomes and books but, you know, they're just like from, you know, stuff that we will recognize. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the other thing that I noticed when it, when it came to um, when it came to Kingsland is go is going for a the, going for a theocratic um, martial nation. Now, yes, obviously, I obviously given given some of the stuff I've talked I've talked about in the past I'm fr I'm fairly aware of of what a theocratic nation is go is going to look like but what about Kingsland makes it a theocratic martial nation my concept again was sort of in my mind I thought it would be interesting to do something more like uh, the medieval Japanese social structure you know where the samurai is, you know, the most important person in their culture. And so I don't know, it's it's really just kind of that simple. Which I I can I can certainly see that, especially especially given um some of the some of the remarks that are there on the preview images. Um in ter in terms of in terms of having a ver a an a implied virtue to the to the struct to the kingdom's structure yeah 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 for sure it, it's it's in order to keep this going which which you know i think many uh uh or uh, many many people have figured out is you've got to have an almost cult-like belief and buy-in to the system mm -hmm. you know or, or it collapses and of of course, some of course, something that something that certainly doesn't hurt is is have is having having your protagonist using a using a, a um so, a sword that's that's right on the hip. It's not try it's not trying to go full die show, but just enough to make <laughs> pe to make people rem to make people be reminded of such. Because um, I would I would say or I would say that um. Matthias's we Matthias's weapon is, I think that's supposed to be a bastard sword from how from how it looks. It's what it's yeah, like, definitely definitely uh, uh, influenced mm -hmm. by that. Um, and I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to get I'm not going to do a whole do a whole thing about how, about about how it, about how it's being held there because what do I what do I look like shadversity here. <laughs> <laughs> But see again, any anything that I that I did in in this story and in trying to create this world is one where it, there wasn't. In, they were learning again. Mm -hmm. They were learning again, and and any of the things that that doesn't seem normal to us, if you will. Well, they don't have anything to base that on. It's whatever it is is what they came up with on their own. You know, there's not some ancient master teaching them swordplay. Mm -hmm. You know, they're becoming that. What's my idea? Yeah, anyways. <laughs> and I do get, I do get the, I do get the feeling that. I know you. I know you mentioned, um, you meant you mentioned the you mentioned that one of the first things that you came up with when the when you were creating War Priest was the design of of Matthias. 
but what what would you say were some of the were some of the media that inspired you to take to take the routes that you did because it's definitely a, it's definitely a design that no that no one's going to forget and we can and we can hope we well, at the very least I'm tall enough where I could probably pull off cosplaying it one day <laughs> right right um, it's funny you bring that up. I mean, this this is this is this is so funny to me. Um, I I am an intentional comic book creator. Um, cosplay was definitely something on my mind, and and cosplay and uh, uh, fan art. You know, mm-hmm. I don't. I didn't want to. I wanted something that would be interesting and memorable but also easy for people to enjoy and create their own and take their own takes on it. Um, You know, that was an, that was part of the intent. You know, I don't like to make some, I don't like to make a lot of my stuff too complicated for what, you know, showing off. It's, it's, I like simple designs and I like what you can do with simple designs. And I like how, you know, I also have to, be productive and if it was some big elaborate costume that's going to be hard to draw on every page so there's there's a lot of of thought put into the simplicity of that costume Mm -hmm. and um to be to be fair when it comes when it comes to when it comes to comic when it comes to um character and and costume design i've off i've often had the attitude of the kiss method. Keep it simple, stupid. Because yeah, yeah. Like I, I look at I, I have, and this is this is a problem that I have that I have had with um, with adaptate with adaptations and the like of of superheroes for the for the bet for the bet for the better part of tw- of twenty five years. Yeah, right. Is tr- is take is trying to take a simple design and trying to created more and more complicated in the name of trying to justify its existence um, <laughs> yep yep i now if you if you want to if you want a perfect example of of how of how this can backfire cons, consider the consider the batman design in the nolan trilogy like nolan spent then an entire movie just explaining every single detail <laughs> Of this costume to try to try and to try and make it seem quote unquote realistic, and yet yeah. the costume is so is so Im- is so immobile. That's why they had to do all the damn close up shots. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, I look, I, I look at a lot. I look at a lot of the. I'd say one of the rare cases of a co- of a comic book design that. That en- that ended up maintaining a degree of a degree of um simplicity. As- aside from say the Superman movies, even the bad ones, um, <laughs> is Blade. Yeah. Oh, now grant now granted the that version of Blade is a far far removed version of Blade that was that I saw in to- in Ghost Rider and Tomb of Dracula growing up, but <laughs> right. And a lot of that is because is because of what because of Snipes wanting to be hands on, which is ultimately why no one else can play the character. And I said that I know that I know there's an upcoming film, but as far as I'm concerned, there is only one Blade, and his name is Wesley Snipes. But, I am going to struggle with that. Yeah, but the but the setup with that with with that particular des, design that he that he put forward, you know, with the. With the coat, the sun, the sunglasses, the the sword, and the um, and that little double bladed boomerang thing, um, you look at that and you're and you're not going to mistake it for for something else, um, right? You're going, and with a lot of with a lot of other um, designs, especially in, especially in film, um, there seems to be this mandate that we, that you need to put all these extra details, and there's nowhere for the eye to really go which is which is the key thing i'd say when it comes to a design like when it comes to a design for um matthias the eyes are probably going to go to the hat yeah they're going to go to the hat they're going to go then then maybe the then maybe the cloak and the and the and the sword but 
there's not a whole, but there's a focus where they where they can start and then just expand out from there. I I think I think right. I I, I think it does lend itself. I guess you could make it more uh, uh, opulent, but but if the hat's there and the sword's hanging off of his hip. I, I kind of don't think, you know, who cares what else? Yeah. If somebody needs to justify their job and make it, you know, this ornamental thing, as long as everything is, is black and has the collar mm -hmm. uh, and has the hat, you know, I think it'll work. I think it would work. Yeah. And there's not a whole lot to, uh, it's hard to mess it up in my mind, but, <laughs> you know. Who knows? Something something else that I noticed when I looked at the when I looked at the preview page that I find very interesting is throughout throughout a lot of it, um, we're only see we're only seeing at most half of his face. Yeah. Um, and in a weird way, it re in a weird way, it reminded me of um, Judge Dredd. In in the sense sure. that there, it's pretty it's pretty much a rule that Dredd never takes his helmet off. Yeah. I know. I know. Some people might po might point to the move. Might point to the Stallone movie. That doesn't count. <laughs> no, it does not count. No. Um, and it and if his helmet is off, it's sh it's in shadow. What what problem? Right. You know, is this whole thing of not seeing Matthias's full face something that you maintain throughout the throughout the entire comic, or was it, or am I just seeing an isolated case of it? Um, it's, it's not throughout the entire comic. He's, his face isn't revealed until about midway through. Um, when it's, it's, uh, in my mind, it's, it's the war priest is the, is the costume and his mission. Mm -hmm. Um, so it doesn't matter at that point who he is. He is a war priest on a mission. But once you hit sort of the middle of the book and it be, starts to become more personal and you start to get who he is in, in this world that he lives in, then, you know, the hat comes off. And, and, and quite honestly, the hat comes off in a fight, but he's pretty much not wearing the hat for the rest of the rest of the book there. Um, you know, he picks up the hat when it's time to get back to business. Mm -hmm. But for sort of that middle section where his his sort of personality comes out more, does that make sense? So, so it's a it's a you don't see his face because it doesn't matter. Because I wanted to have this idea of him just being, you know, he's a man on a mission, not a person yet that we need to care about. Which I can, I can I can certainly um, I can certainly see I can certainly see where where that kind of thing is going, um, because because there maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong on this, but there is a certain sort of um, I'd say there is prob there's probably a certain sort of known fame or infamy regarding war priests. And yeah, absolutely. So when so when 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 someone is see, when one is seen, i.e. the i.e. doing the whole the hat the hat coming into coming into town like an old west, um, mm -hmm. nope nobody's going nobody's going to just look around like it like there's some kind of stranger. They're going to react in a positive or negative fashion. That's correct. Yes. Whereas without it, with with the hat off, it's Matthias. Right. Yeah. That's that's exactly it. You know, he's a he's a person with a name without the hat with the hat. He's trouble. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm you, you know, I, definitely. When it comes to hats <laughs> and what they mean, what they what they do for you, uh, you know, obviously every Clint Eastwood movie. You know, had some influence on me in that mm -hmm. way, you know, even in, in the way that I portrayed it and even the shadows on his face you yeah. know it's fun it's funny you it's funny you mention now obviously when you brought up clint eastwood my, my mind immediately went to the dollars trilogy and the man with no name um but it's interesting that it's interesting that that gets brought up given how um 
a lot of a lot of allusions and comparisons have been have been made over the years between um what between westerns and um samurai films over the years. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um the most the most obvious case in the, in this regard being the being the Magnificent 7 which Kurosawa jokingly remarked <laughs> that he made more money off of that than he did, than he did <laughs> off of the Seven Samurai. <laughs> right. Um which is it's it although um since then since he also said that the only reason he became a director was so he had an excuse to edit something um take the facetiousness with a grain of salt <laughs> but that's funny now what what prompted what prompted the idea of doing a enhanced edition of issue one and what's going to be in it compared to the compared to its original version Okay, that's that's also a good question, and it only makes sense to a handful of people. Um, this book was was originally published by a company called Ashcan Comics, and it came out in April of 2020, which means nobody anywhere saw it. There was no <laughs> there was no uh, cons to go to. There was no you know there was nothing. Um, and Ashcan has since changed their business model. I, I couldn't even tell you what they're doing anymore, but there were some people that saw the original story. So what the enhanced edition is, is I did take the opportunity to go back and fix the lettering that I didn't like to change certain panels of the art that I thought could be better. Um, and then also what, what you will get or would get on the Kickstarter um, is also sort of an artist edition where all 32 pages, it just in black and white with no, no color, no, no words, just the art. Um, and a few other, you know, bits and pieces uh, that I'll put in there. You know, some of the stuff that we're talking about tonight, you know, will, will be in there sort mm -hmm. of explaining some of, of what, what my influences were and things like that. So the, the enhanced edition is probably wasn't super necessary, but at the same time, there were enough people that had seen it that I felt like I needed to give a little bit more than just the regular issue. Um, chapter two, which I'll be working on soon is already written and some of the arts done. That will just be a regular comic. Uh, when that time comes, but yeah, that's really what the enhanced edition is about is sort of because what, what happened with, with war priest is, is I actually completed it in early 2019. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I'm an active working artist. And so there's a lot of things that I don't do anymore that I did in that book. So some of the stuff was just driving me nuts. Um, so like I said, I took the opportunity to change a little bit of the art from what was originally there and things like that. But yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things is, is as an artist, I love seeing other artists raw work. Um, and I, I don't know. I just, hopefully somebody else will find that interesting too. So that's a lot of what, what this is about. Does that all? Does that also include the zine that's that's men that's mentioned in the um, stretch? Not not the stretch goals, but in the um, reward tiers of a the reward of a um, sixteen page zine. I'm curious about what I'm curious about that. Um. So that's going to be. Um. I have a one page story that I love, so I'm going to put that in there. I have a few other stories that I'm working on. I'm going to put some of the art from that in there. I, I call it a zine because that's what the printing process is, but it's it's more or less a sketchbook, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be, um, you know, not a sketchbook in the sense of doodles, but it will be a sketchbook in the sense of, you know, other other things that I'm working on and other other, you know, things. I do have a story that I'm going to tell one day, that is very much uh, Conan-esque. Um, but again, it goes back to some of, 
of my my personal situations and so um to me well this gets complicated but you know there was there was the the, the beginnings of humanity um you know before you know in 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 the the uh the horn of africa mm-hmm. and you know we spread out from there and humans you know, and this kind of goes back to the dystopian future thing. Humans tend to just think of their immediate surroundings. But if you mix, you know, science and religion and all of those things, you're talking about utterly thousands and thousands of years of of people. But when we look back and think of, well, yeah, there were people 150,000 years ago. Well, yeah, there was life, you know, generations of people living and dying. Mm -hmm. There has to be a, there has to be a story there. (laughs) You know, it's not just a paragraph in a history book. There's, there's humanity there. And so one of the things I'm going to put in there is, is uh, my character uh, named Mapandi, who is, you know, a a very Conan-like character. Um, and in, you know, a world that I believe very much could have existed, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's, cer- that's, cer- that's certainly going to be an interesting, ap- interesting approach, especially since, um, something, something that I, something that I find very interesting whenever, um, whenever certain writers try and, try and, um, try and handle a story, a story, in some, in some part of Africa is that there is that they're always they're always using the same region of Africa um specific specifically something around the the Niger Delta or the or the savanna right so, no and no the problem is Africa is is not a country it's a friggin continent and it's fucking huge it is. It is. And if, if you and anyone who hears this wants to think about where my story might take place, go look at the look up the Ethiopian Highlands mm-hmm. on the Internet and you're not going to see an Africa that you are normally being shown. And it is I am excited. I hope I get to do this story one day because it's not even about Africa. It's about the beginnings of humanity. And yes, everyone is going to have dark skin because that's what <laughs> that's what was there. It's not a it's not a story. I'm not trying to to do anything other than tell a story and and have it be as as accurate as possible. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I don't know. I think it'll be fun. I think it'll be a really interesting world to explore. And I do think, like you said, it's not the typical, you know, thing that that gets portrayed, you know. And I think that's I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, the I, the word Africa isn't even, you know, again, this is this is a different world and a different time, and before anything that we think we know even existed. Mm-hmm. And. Also, also, while you're mentioning, I did, I did take, I did take a look at the Ethiopian Highlands, and that, um, the the amount, the amount of greenery and the and the rock church, the um, I've seen mm-hmm. some, I've seen some call that area the roof of Africa, and I'm, I'm like, yeah. um, why haven't there been more fancy settings set here? <laughs> right, exactly. Like exactly. I mean, for fuck's sake, we need, I, <laughs> I um. <laughs> Every, every but every poli- every politician was ta- was talking about Brexit a few years ago. I think I think we need more fantasy writers getting getting the hell out of the UK when it comes I, when it comes I, to how they set up their fantasy. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 my whole point of it is I wanted to go so far back in time, and when you do that, you find this whole world that has not been explored. And it's, it's, it's there, it's ripe for the, for the, for the stories, Mm -hmm. you know, and you can tell stories that we're familiar with in unfamiliar places, 
I think that's pretty neat. I think that's pretty neat. Yeah. I um I remember a, I remember a long time time ago saying that somebody somebody could 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 write it could write a fantastical epic just based on the Zulu Empire. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. There's so much untapped stories out there. You know, I don't know how political you get, but you know, our our stories are all you know, a, a white uh, you know, everything is 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 like you said, you know, this European sort of thing because that's who's you know, been able to tell the most stories, but I don't want to, I don't need to tell those mm -hmm. stories anymore. Those stories have been told to death. I don't want to tell those stories. I want to find new places to tell stories. When it comes, um, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd say, I'd say that a bit, I'd say that a big, re a big reason, at least when it, at least when it comes to fantasy is for a lot, for a lot of people, the template to do a, to do a yeah. fantasy epic is Lord of the Rings. Absolutely. And, and yep. I, I love Lord of the Rings to death, but Lord of the, but that is that is go that is going f that is going for a very specific region and the big and the big problem that ended up developing. And granted, um stuff like D&D &D certainly did not help this. Mm -hmm. Is tr is treating the style of fantasy that Tolkien was presenting that ve that very um that very ho that hodgepodge of of Britain Britain I Ireland and um and a bit and a bit of Norse within it sure as the default creates a creates a set of expectations that don't match the idea that, that if that if I'm and I know that's the case because I distinctly rem I distinctly remember um, when I was when I was playing Planescape Torment growing up and seeing forum posts about people saying that it's too weird to be considered fantasy, which I found <laughs> I found ridiculous then and I still find ridiculous. And I brought this up the, that is ridiculous. I brought this up in the past, but I and I use Planescape as an exa as an example in this case because. Of the fact that that's not trying to go for any specific kind of region, it's trying to go for a very surrealist um, attitude. It it was like that with the with the original A D and D module, and its video game adaptation is no different. Trying to trying to apply a trying to apply the tropes that you would use for a very British style of fantasy don't really work with something like Planescape, right? Um, and when it and the and the problem is when when that's when that's the expectation there's there's the it's a case of um the, of the snowball rolling downhill getting getting bigger and bigger because then you have the circular thing of we have we have to do things in this expected way because we've always done things in this expected way and it just <laughs> right it just go it just goes round round and round and round yeah um and granted granted we've i have start i we started to see that that re that really um that really start we re started to see the first cracks of that i'd say in i'd say in the 70s during the um during the kung fu craze because a lot of the, a lot of those films mm -hmm. were in the same theaters as a lot of um black exploitation other exploitation kind of films right like, like, the right. grindhouse cinemas the for lack of a better term ghetto theaters yes and the and that when that took off that kind of formed the first crack then we ended up going a little bit further with that with the ninja craze of the 80s and <laughs> and th and things just kind of um, spi spiraled f further and f further, um, and I've po I've pointed out a cup a couple instances that I that I grew ver that I've been fond of for years in the tabletop realm of stuff like Exalted and Legend of the Five Rings. Um, Exalted's particular brand of fantasy has more in, has more in common with um gr with a hodgepodge of manga influences and Greek ep and Greek ep Greek and Indian epics. Oh wow. And Legend of the Five Rings is 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 um samurai fantasy essentially, 
um, just one that pe that a lot of people misconstrue because they think that it's trying to be a representation of Japan when it's not. <laughs> and they, ne <laughs> and right. they never they never claimed they never they never claimed as such. They were trying they were the designers of it were people who grew up watching um samurai fi samurai films and wanted to do something like that. Yeah. Um, but and when it when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to um, the on, the main one, the main one that I can think of when it comes to an when it comes to a representation in um, in some part in some part of Africa that isn't trying to do the Niger Delta or the Savannah is Bastion, which is more about West Africa. Um, and, I th and to further to further go on this point, are are you familiar with the burgeoning metal scene in Botswana? <laughs> No, but I will be looking for that now. <laughs> um, now, now, granted, a lot of it has a lot has a lot of people wear a lot of people wearing leathers that can that can in no way be comfortable in that kind of heat. Trying, <laughs> trying to pose, trying to pose like the cover of the Ace of Spades album from Motorhead. But oh wow! It but it is fa it is fast. But seeing that scene develop on its own has been a fascinating has been a fascinating development. That's and, that's awesome, and it kind of goes into that whole that whole thing of um, stories from uh, from other angles, even um, and even when even when it comes to more European approaches, I you're you're probably familiar with how bit with how big The Witcher has gotten over the last few years. Oh yeah, and for for me the the theory as to the theory I had as to why that blew up is that is that was. That was a that was a style of fantasy that, while it may take while it may be taking some very very heavy notes from Michael Moorcock, whose work is great, mm -hmm. and I recommend everyone read the Elric books. Oh yeah, also the, another big influence yeah. on Warpriest. Um, The Witcher is was a, was ostensibly Eastern European, Asten um, yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of, a lot of what it references, and a lot of the storytelling styles that it has, are are ripped are ripped straight from the folklore of of Poland and um and um other areas within Eastern Europe, and that and that was going to inspire other people to to essentially do essentially do the same, um, right, and it's. Again, again, it's it's the whole thing of you're start you're starting to see more and more pe you're starting to see more and more people with time come to the realiz come to this realization that you don't need to do fan fantasy in that Tolkien esque approach if it doesn't fit what's what you're tr what you're trying to accomplish. Right, right. I mean, it deserves. I mean, it's fantastic, mm -hmm. but you can't, you don't have to force your story to fit into that, you know, that world that he created. And in, fa in fact, that, in fact, in some cases, I'd argue doing that creates more problems than it solves because of the amount of detail that he put into his, they put into his own setting. That's true. Um, That's true. Now... <laughs> To, with all with all that with all that in, with all that in mind, um, now that now I do want to congratulate you for how for how far you just shattered the um the initial goal that you had set because you were originally asking for um seven hundred for for this and it's currently yeah. just under thirty three hundred. Yes, yes. Oh wow, yes, just under. Look at that. Mm-hmm. Thirty six hours to go. Yep, at at the time of this recording. So, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> look, look. I've look. I I I I'm one of those forever GMs, and I always have to warn people that to never attract the ire of the dice gods. <laughs> but get but. Take, but taking that into account, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for, um, for some for War Priest um, Enhanced Edition? 
so the the great news is is the work is done um so you know compiling it uh is the last step so you know anyone who did uh digital only hopefully will be seeing them you know within just a few weeks at the most and then print you know the print orders um i'll be able to get the the print order into the printer you know again within uh, uh you know kickstarter i don't know if you've ever done kickstarter or deal with it i won't actually get the pledged money um for i think almost two weeks after it ends yep so once i can once i can you know collect that money and get the print order going you know i, I my estimate is what is it april uh, may june i'm hoping to have them all in the mail by june um and again that's not because the work's not done it's just logistics and printing and shipping so mm -hmm. Yeah, the good news is all the work is done on this one. So it's just a matter of getting, uh, you know, getting the printed copies. Which is, which I'll certainly be, I'll certainly be looking forward to in my, in my own fashion. Especially, especially since it's, like I said, it's, it's rare, it's rare that I can look, that I can look at a certain, I can look at a certain design in fiction and say, that looks like it's meant for tall people. <laughs> that's great that's great so you're i guess you're tall <laughs> yeah i'm 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 six six and because, oh wow all right beca and because of that because of that um cer certain certain clothes shopping is always a pain and yeah, low I ceilings i've broken like three exit I... signs <laughs> oh no um <laughs> But with yeah. with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. <laughs> um, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I I, often... uh, I definitely will. <laughs> as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I've been doing some of that too. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>